Ruprecht Potsdam, thank you very much indeed for your availability and for agreeing to discuss the latest development in German and European competition law. I propose we start with the case which resonates not only within the competition cluster, but also appears often in, in, in general in general media. I refer obviously to the German uh, Facebook case, which we have you know, some, some, some recent update, but for, for those of us who, who don't have it on the, top, on the top of our head, can you just very briefly remind the, 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 what it's all about? Sure, thank you Olesh for, uh, for having me. That's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. Um, now, the Facebook case, that's really probably one of the most thrilling cases uh, we've come across in our lifespan. And, and, and some people say it's one of the really big cases of competition law because it redefines a couple of angles or you can discuss a lot of things that we are constantly considering on a real case. And that's what the fun is about. What the Bundeskartellamt, the German Competition Authority, said in its original decision, which came out in 2019 after three years of investigation, is that it is a violation of competition law, an abuse of a dominant position, if Facebook um, combines data from different sources, not only its own Facebook social network, but also other sources like Instagram and WhatsApp, which are Facebook-owned companies or now Meta-owned companies, and third-party sources, so coming from websites all over the net. Because if you, if you use a website and this website has some Facebook plugin, Facebook business tools or something where you see, oh, I can give a like for that website, this website is connected with Facebook and delivers data to Facebook. And all these data are combined together and Facebook builds super profiles, as we call that, for users. So Facebook knows, knows an awful lot about you, not just from the use of the social network, but also from other websites. And this may be in violation of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, because that's what the Bundeskartellamt said, people don't agree in the necessary way to this collection and combination of data. And this, so the Kartellamt argues, maybe we go into more sort of details, but uh, argues that this amounts to an abuse of a dominant position. And then obviously the decision was, um, it, it's not that, st that straightforward because we hear several very powerful narratives being, you know, uh, articulated uh, in, in, in the course now, uh, in the course of its development. And one of the most powerful counter argument, the most obvious, perhaps from the kind of traditional perspective is what does uh, Bundeskartellamt uh, have to do with the GDPR, which is you know, a separate area of law, which has its own authority to, to supervise this, this development. Isn't it a, a, a too proactive uh, way of, of applying the, the rules? And what, what, what is it, where, do we, where are we here in, in this regard? Difficult to say, and that's uh, that's linked with the um, tough uh, or the, the the complicated story of this case. So the Bundeskartellamt, in its original decision from 2019, argued pretty strongly, not exclusively, but relied pretty strongly on that GDPR violation, if there is one. Right. So the case is still pending, so the final outcome is not there. But but um, they, if you if you read the ruling really narrowly. Uh, the decision by the Bundeskartellamt, you could really say, okay, they say if a dominant company like Facebook on the market for social networks, if that company um, violates your GDPR rights, that is an abuse of a dominant position. The Bundeskartellamt didn't say just as in your face as, as I put it now, but, but that was sort of the reading that came out of this, or it, it relied strongly on this. It also put some competition law theory, et cetera, into it, but that was the main thrust of it. Now, um, if, if, I, if I may, I tell you a bit about how that story went on, which is, is an interesting story in itself, uh, because of course, always, as always in the law, we have checks and balances, we have courts looking into that, and obviously Facebook challenged this case. I say obviously, because people looking into the case and people like me say, this case really hits Facebook hard. 
And this is probably something that we have to keep in mind. This is a competition case where we think that it really goes right into the heart of the business model of one of the big GAFA companies, because this combination of data, the super profiling, um, the, the tracking of users, and then the use of this for personalized advertising, targeted advertising for selling information on people, et cetera, all this is what Facebook is all about. Facebook makes money by advertising. And if you now go into their data collection and stop them from combining data from all sorts of different sources, you take away one of their key elements of their business plan. So this is why this case is so important for Facebook. And this is also why this case is so interesting for, for us, because as you know, we often discuss in competition or what is the right remedy? How can we really do something about a monopoly position or, or high concentration? And, and we sometimes, particularly in the digital field, have the impression we don't have the right remedies or we don't really go for the real problem. Now, in this case, we do that. I think this really hits hard on Facebook. So Facebook challenged the, court, the case, obviously, took it to court, which is the uh, Court of Appeals in Düsseldorf, the higher regional court, the Oberlandesgericht, as we call it in German. And this Düsseldorf court really... Uh, smashed that decision of the Bundeskartell onto pieces. It dissected it and it said, what you're doing has nothing to do with competition law. You have a lot of flaws in your decision. And it really pinpointed, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and mainly said, we don't see any competitive harm being done here. You're engaging in the field of data protection law, of privacy law, this is not your field the Irish Data Protection Authority is the relevant authority to deal with that. And that's in, in a way that is somewhat true because the Facebook has its uh, key, um, its, its main um, um, uh, seat in, in Ireland. And according to the GDPR, it's the Irish Data Protection Authority that has to check whether Facebook in the EU complies with um, data protection. Now, the Irish Data Protection Authority hasn't really done anything meaningful about Facebook's data policies, so that's at least my reading of what they're doing. And um, so, so there is a certain conflict of competencies or of applying these rules. Now, the Düsseldorf court said, you, Bundeskartellamt, as a competition authority, may not use this argument, GDPR violation, and then say this is an abuse in competition terms. But the case went on. And by the way, this decision was in interim proceedings. So speedy, relatively, relatively speedy proceedings. So um, half a year after the decision had been out, which is immediately enforceable under German law, the Düsseldorf court stopped the Bundeskartellamt and said, you may not enforce. Now the Bundeskartellamt went to the higher authority, the German Federal Court of Justice, the Supreme Court in Germany for, for competition matters. And about a year later, in June 2020, this court, again in speedy interim proceedings, took the decision, said, we stand with the Bundeskartellamt in the, in its, in the outcome of the case, but they presented a really different argument, or they, they reframed the case a bit, which is unusual at this stage in interim proceedings by the court. Um, so that was stunning. And they did not really focus on the GDPR violation but they said what Facebook does is actually a pretty straightforward, normal violation of abusive dominance. And GDPR is one aspect under many that feeds into this case, but it is not like following directly from the GDPR that there is an abuse of dominance. And that makes it so difficult to, to say what really is the theory of harm in this case or what are we really discussing because we have the Bundeskartellamt's decision, we have the um, now the ruling of the Supreme Court, and now the case goes on in, in courts, and both readings of the decision, both narratives, as you said, are somewhat, somewhat different, because it, they differ in how strongly they argue with the GDPR violation. And uh, if we... But when we continue talking about the theory of harm, which is one of the most you know, discussed aspect of this ongoing, of this ongoing case, um, I recollect your very appealing and powerful 
argument, I think it's in line with the, the latest uh, opinion of, of Advocate General uh, Rantos uh, in this case, that uh, if you infringe uh, tax law and you are definitely in violation of, of, of some taxation policy, you harm your competitors in doing so. But there is no clear cut uh, protocol how to kind of transpose the harm from which you have conducted within one area of law to competition law. And until recently, with very powerful price theory, we would have a quite conservative, but almost consensually agreed upon metrics, how we can somehow do the calculation. Now, when, when we're talking about zero price market, it's getting the, the currency, is, there is no single currency, it's kind of several currencies can, uh, running simultaneously within this kind of discussion uh, by the decision makers. Can you please elaborate on this specific, first, it's kind of philosophical ap approach, yeah, by uh, say, saying, okay, you, you, you kill your competitor, but you didn't violate competition law. So it, it, you basically, your, your logic here is that, okay, um, uh, you do exploit, without necessarily uh, ticking the boxes of, of Article 102. But this, this, the, the very fact that it's not necessarily within the ambit of Article 102, or you, you use a reference to other areas of law like GDPR incidentally, doesn't change the, the essence of the problem. Let me maybe start with, with a quick word on how that German Supreme Court reframed the case in, in, in a bit more detail. What they said was um, the abuse of dominance of Article 102, they actually looked at the German uh, paragraph 19 for that, but uh, what they said is the abuse is that is, is on, rests on two pillars. The first is you exploit your customers, your, your consumers, the Facebook users actually, because you give them something that they haven't asked for Namely, you, you give them a very rich personal experience of the Facebook network, and they have to pay for that with their data. That's sort of the very straightforward application of um, data as a currency. Straightforward in the sense of this is new, obviously. It's not like, and you cannot sort of, as you say, calculate that. But they say, okay, you get more than you maybe wanted because you don't have a choice. It's a take it or leave it choice that you get when you are a Facebook user. Either, either you can use that social network, that monopolistic social network in Germany, um, giving the data, get, giving that, getting that uh, experience, or you, or you have no access to that. And in doing so, they are, they, the, the users are exploited because they don't have a real say on what they want to give, what they, what they can do, um, uh, whether they want this sort of extensive use of their data. And the court frames this sort of exploitative bid very interestingly, uh, on the one hand, in, in, a, in the terms of this is um, some sort of bundling because you get very much and more than you wanted. Um, and you have to pay for that because we pay for bundles, uh, maybe even if it's in disguise of data. And on the other hand, they also said this has an element of consumer choice or consumer sovereignty. And that's something that I personally find very stunning because this differs a lot from the more traditional consumer welfare approach that we see in, um, say, mainstream competition law, antitrust law, maybe in the US or, or maybe also in, in in, in other um, systems where we say, okay, either you show that there is real harm to the consumer's purse, so they have to pay more uh, than they wanted to, or, or it's not an antitrust violation. Now, the German Bundesgerichtshof, the, the Supreme Court says, no, um, markets run on free decisions of consumers on their autonomy. This is what, what the market process is about, the competitive process is about. You need the consumer deciding in the end. They, consumers need to have a substantial say on what's going on. And in particular, they also have this say regarding their data. And that's the constitutional aspect and the GDPR aspect feeding into this idea of competition is also about consumer choice. That's sort of part of the reasoning of the, of, the, um, of the Bundesgerichtshof. And then they add to that, 
a more traditional um, competition law aspect, which, which is also very well elaborated in the sense that they say, if, um, if you exploit this user side, if you get a lot of data from users, this also raises the market barriers, the entry barriers for competitors on the other market side for advertising, because um, you, can, you can network effects, data, et cetera, you get more and more, others have less possibilities to enter the market. And here they connect the, the two market sides of the platform. You know, we are discussing these platform economics now for a while. Um, and in what you said, Oles, when, we, when you introduced this, I think that's exactly the interesting point that the, the Bundesgerichtshof now argues on the one hand with this consumer choice approach somehow, but on the other hand, also very consequentially looks into the two market sides and doesn't isolate the user side from the advertising side because that's the typical connecting bit of platforms. So on the philosophical level, I mean, you're the experts, expert for philosophy of, uh, of markets much more than I am. But I think that the interesting shift here really is um, on this in the second decision um, is the shift from a very strong monetary consumer welfare approach to a much more back to the competitive, maybe even auto liberal approach um, of uh, competition law as we knew it. And uh, can, you, can you also please uh, highlight a little bit uh, this fundamental rights stuff uh, issue? Because there were counter arguments to this to this uh, proposition that it's not within the uh, you know traditional expectation for the private entity to to somehow proactively endorse fundamental rights. That there is kind of if you are a normal an ordinary business. The expectation is that you just comply with the minimum level and you, you are not expected to, to somehow to take this into account as your, as your main uh, business, uh, within your main business activity. Very good point. Thanks for, thanks for reminding me of that. I, I, I dropped that thought uh, before, but actually what the court says um, is Facebook, with its social networking capacities, with its messaging services, uh, etc., is a f is sort of in a casey infrastructural position for communication in society. And if a private entity like Facebook is so strong in and so important for the discourse, for communication, for free speech, actually, in society, then the fundamental rights have to kick in. And that's also something very interesting, which, is, which had been actually said before by the German Constitutional Court um, in, in other matters that private entities sometimes are bound by, um, directly bound by fundamental rights if they are so important for guaranteeing these fundamental rights. And that's, that's really stunning development because I think that we see here um, that the court acknowledges that these companies, Facebook, Google, and others, have become so powerful that they are even able to really have a substantial influence on how we exercise our very fundamental rights. And, and I find it very sort of logical that we say, okay, it's no, not only the state that is bound by this, but also so powerful entities that are maybe even more powerful than the state sometimes. I mean, look at the figures of what they have, how, how, how valuable they are, and, and our difficulties in controlling them, that they need to respect this and that they need to do their fair share. And I find that also in the in the European court's judgment on um, Google Shopping somehow, where, where I mean, you, we all know that under Article 102 of the treaty, we say that dominant companies have a special responsibility. Now, what the court in Google Shopping says is, Google, Google's search is not just dominant, Google is super dominant or ultra dominant. Now, if you are super dominant, ultra dominant, what does that mean for your special responsibility? It's not, not only a special responsibility for competition in the markets, it's a super special, an ultra special uh, responsibility. And I find that sort of path that we are going there quite interesting because I think that really leads to the Digital Markets Act as well. And probably, uh one of the last questions related to, to Facebook is uh, maybe I combine two and you will decide how to answer them. Where we are currently, what is, uh, what, what's the central message uh, which we can infer from the, the opinion of our general Rantos, which has been published very recently in September 2022. 
And the more conceptual question is this constant dialogue, which we are somehow expected to engage with, uh, with our kind of sister agencies and sister areas of law, like data protection and uh, you know, media uh, watchdogs, uh, financial uh, market regulators, etc. It's getting more and more in, in, in intensified and it's getting more and more obvious that we are entering into the stage where this kind of insulated, self, self-sufficient uh, vision of competition law as a kind of cluster of where we master our economic, economic and uh, casuistic skill is not sufficient. It must be more uh, open to communication. So maybe we can uh, finish with Facebook uh, by you articulating the position of, of Advocate General uh, Ranters, uh, the opinion, uh, the, the central ideas of the opinion, and uh, move into this kind of interagency dialogue stuff. Well, Advocate General Ranters gave his opinion just sort of for people who are now sort of confused of what's going on. We are now in the main proceedings of the case. So everything I've said about rulings before was related to interim proceedings. Now the main proceedings have started and the Dusseldorf court, which is known for being a bit sort of um, tough in, in what they're doing said, okay, now in main proceedings, we sent the case to the court of justice in Luxembourg and asked for their opinion, whether that is even possible to look into the GDPR in a competition case and whether the reading of the GDPR that the Bundeskartellamt has done is in line with European law. So that's why that's actually why we have that case at the European stage right now. And now Advocate General Rantos, as you said, gave, it, gave his opinion. And to be frank, I read it as a pretty big win for the Bundeskartellamt, particularly if you look at the questions of the Düsseldorf court, because the Düsseldorf court, I said, is very critical of the Bundeskartellamt's decision, now sent it to, to Luxembourg, but with, with the wording and the framing that is critical of that, of that original opinion. And then we, we were watching the hearing, the hearing um, of the case uh, is, was transmitted via, via web. And when you saw that, and when you saw the piercing questions of the advocate general, of the judges to the Bundeskartellamt, you really thought, oh my God, that case will never pass uh, in, in, in Luxembourg. But now the opinion of the advocate general, in my view, is very favorable of the Bundeskartellamt's approach and actually says, of course, of course, as a competition authority, you have to look or you can look into GDPR violations because this is the framework of the market that the, in, in the data economy companies are engaging in. So you have to take that into account. And if, if th that defines your, your market, um, if whether what, what, the, what, the, uh, what is going on there or whether you are engaging in, in, in the right form of competition, because if you don't respect the law, then you are not, cannot be protected. So, so I thought the statement in that regard by Advocate General Rantos regarding can competition authority look into, into um, GDPR violations is a very clear cut um, sort of strengthening of the, of the, of the general approach, particularly of the approach of the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court's view is absolutely not problematic with Rantos. And also in the other, in the other aspects, um, like, is it really a free choice if you, if you enter into a contract with a dominant company? What about the GDPR violations? I think that Rantos sides a lot with the more competition-friendly side with the side of the Bundeskartellamt, but I maybe don't go into details here because I want to answer or go to that other question that you put up, namely, what is then the relationship between the fields? And I think you open up a field here, which is, which is interesting on a very legal doctrinal basis, but also on a very political philosophical level. On the legal doctrinal basis, we really have to check, okay, who is competent? How are these competences um, developed? How are they assigned? How, what feeds into what? And that's a lot of legal stuff. For instance, we have a rule in Article 51 of the GDPR saying um, the GDPR authority, there is a GDPR authority which is responsible and they have to cooperate with other GDPR authorities, et cetera. And now Rantos said, yes, that's right, but we don't have anything that really tells us how competition agencies and data protection agencies interact. So we, we are back to basics and have to look into basics of loyal cooperation within the EU, et cetera. And essentially says, yes, please inform one another. Please 
talk with one another. And if one of you is really the lead authority, please respect that opinion. Now, if the Irish Data Protection Authority had issued a verdict on Facebook's data use in this case, then the Bundeskartellamt would have had to oblige with that or would have to comply with that. That's essentially what he says, but they hadn't done that. So, um, so then maybe it's okay, as the Bundeskartellamt says they have done, to communicate with the Irish Data Protection Authority, and that's it. And I think that what we see here on this legal nitty-gritty detail basis is something that we will see a lot more often and that we see every day because we have so many new acts, new laws for the digital sphere, DMA, DSA, uh, Data Act, Data Governance Act, P2B regulation, competition law, national competition laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have to coordinate a lot and we have to solve that riddle, who does what and how, and does it still match? Because of course, companies need to know what they will have to do and what they have to comply with. And, and if we take that Facebook case, for instance, just as an example, we have this traditional section um, 19 case that is running on like now, which is sort of equivalent to Article 102. But you find that behavior also in the Digital Markets Act nowadays. You find it in a new German national regulation, which is called Section 19A of the Competition Act. So you have at least three or possibly even four or five, and then you have the whole GDPR, but things that deal with this behavior of meta. And now meta lawyers have to know what they have, can do and how this is seen, so, so we need to coordinate it. But on a more political philosophical level, just one word on that, I think this is the debate that the new Brandeis movement or the progressive antitrust movement in the United States put up, namely, what is the responsibility of us competition people regarding topics that go beyond classic competitions. And that's not just privacy, it's also sustainability, it's also inflation, it's uh, what's happening on labor markets, um, what is our, our um, climate protection um, deal, et cetera. And that's, I think, the really interesting question because there's two sort of things that, that one has to take into account. The one is people think that antitrust law can be very powerful and is a good tool to tame big companies and to achieve a lot in the economy. What we often see, take privacy for instance, take sustainability, that it's difficult for others to regulate um, big tech companies. So some people say, yeah, you have a great instrument there and now you try to use it for basically everything. That's not the right approach. That's what some people say. But on the other hand, and that is what I read from the Ranchos opinion a bit, um, Obviously, we cannot isolate our competition and market approach from what's going on in the world because the market defines what's going on in the world and is influenced by what's going on in the world. So, of course, sustainability is an economic topic in a way. It's a topic that is decided on markets. Privacy is decided by data-driven companies that have that as their competitive edge over others. So we have to take that into account. We have to say something on that. That's my personal opinion. But obviously, and, and that's sort of, you, you said, where are the metrics on that? That's obviously the tough and difficult question to say, where do we draw the line between a still something to do with competition, uh, sustainability question or privacy question, and something that is better left to other authorities, better left to people who are not primarily in, into competition. And that's, that's one of the big questions that we face these days in the competition community. Uh, and we put, probably really have to go back to our very roots, our very fundamental convictions. And me as a German uh, competition lawyer coming from the more older liberal tradition of the 1950s, where people said, we are doing this because we want to achieve a better world or something, which is not restrained to consumer welfare efficiency uh, metrics of the Chicago School. I have a clear side in that. Uh, on this last point, Ruprecht, um, achieving the better world, or, or somehow obviously we, we all understand that ultimately any responsible governments would somehow have this meta goal in mind, or it would be the main imperative yeah, for every governance, obviously. And in this context, um, I, uh, on purely mechanical question or technical question, if we see that it is inevitable that we are getting, we are entering into the stage where different societal, legitimate societal interests interact with each other, 
constantly. We have to take into consideration different factors. Do you have to, to take them into consideration into consideration as competition factors or non-competition factors? Do we just, because the later would envisage that antitrust would remain in its purity, but would develop somehow communication protocols with different areas of law, societal interest, whatever, whatever we call them, without the need to incorporate the different metrics into our own metrics. That would be one approach, more insulated and more open probably would be somehow try to infer some economic value or, or consumer welfare or competitiveness or contestability uh, metrics from this non prima facie at least non economic uh, interest or non competition interest. I think that's really hard to to answer, and I think it's it there is no clear cut answer in the sense of either this way or that way because it probably really clings on on the details of the case. So um, let me take the example of of sustainability agreements, for instance. Um, we have a tendency to ignore external effects in our competition or in our economic law. So uh, if, there are, if, if you pollute, that's usually something that you can thrive on because you don't have to pay for that because the external effects are borne by others. Now, that's a very straightforward economic idea of market failure, external effects, right? So if you, if you don't internalize external effects, that's economists call that a that a market failure, that is something that you can really calculate, you can see what's happening, et cetera. That's something that we do in law and economics or have been doing in law and economics. Um, but in competition law, we have not looked at what are the external effects that a company uses maybe to be in a competitive um, situation, although it is very economic. It's a, it's a pure economic thinking that you put behind that and that you can even calculate. So why not open up our economic thinking for this aspect and and even sort of maybe that's even much more in line with with uh, competition law thinking than than some other sort of more vague ideas and on the other hand if you then look at um, from from a legal perspective and say okay we have the value of free competition in the EU treaty whether we have it or not <laughs> assume we have it as a leading goal of the of the EU to have free competition. And then we have also the social goals. We have, say, the protection of the environment. And we now have to sort of weigh these interests in a normative way somehow on a, on a legal level. Uh, that is something that is far less economic and much more normative. But both come to the same outcome. So I would personally prefer opening our field a bit to a wider sort of um, a broader economic thinking rather than opening it up to a arbitrary weighing of interests. So, so let's integrate more economics, more institutional economics. Let's look into resource economics, into the economics of the environment, et cetera, in our competition analysis, in our economic analysis of a case, that would be sort of, the, for me, the preferred way forward, rather than looking into, um, rather than trying to sort of integrate antitrust or competition as one factor in a big weighing experience, like in a rule of reason approach. I see this point. While I, if we use like kind of 40, 60 to one side, for me, it's rather uh, 60, 40. <laughs> uh, but let us move. Uh, I think we will not leave it uh, outright, this uh, kind of dilemmatic uh, matter, but let us move to the uh, kind of more regulatory uh, response to to all this kind of cascade of challenges which we observe, particularly in digital economy, but not not only over the last few years, or which have been somehow um, institutionalized in the more coherent way of the last few years. We have the DMA, and we obviously also have the member states, EU member states, not response but somehow adaptation to the new reality. And the German experience appears to be landmark in this regard. And you are the person who knows both uh, areas and both systems and comment very, uh, you know, authoritatively on, on, on the development. Can we just, uh, you know, if we can uh, trace 
the, the emergence of the idea of something of, of this kind of new competition tool or, or, or DMA in the, uh, I think, like 2018 and 19. Um, and then how the, 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 some member states, mainly Germany, what was their response and what are the main stakes in this kind of inter, um, inter quality communication between EU member states and the European Union, mainly the Commission, uh, in terms of, of, of sharing competences, probably, but not only. Well, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the first thing that always strikes me is how determined the European response to the digital giants has been over the past years. Uh, that's something that from a more now meta-political uh, public choice uh, view, I'm, I'm still stunned that, that, that that's such a uniform approach in the sense that um, politicians in particularly in Germany, but also on the EU level and also in France and many other countries um, have been very determined to do something about monopolization in the digital sphere, if I may put it like that. Um, I think, by the way, this very strongly comes from the huge lobbying power of newspapers who were the first to, uh, to really suffer from digital advertising eating into their business model. Well, that's a different story, but that sort of strikes me. Now, um, German politicians had a discourse on this, which ran rather in parallel to an EU discourse on this. And uh, what, we, what we saw was that there were attempts in Germany to say, we need to do something about this. The press publisher right was one of the first ideas to sort of regulate this or to, to go for um, some sort of control of that. Um, and then on the EU level, as you rightly said, we had the proposal by the European Commission to, um, to strengthen digital regulation in whatever way. And, and they uh, proposed um, several paths that one may choose. One of these was the new competition tool. And the new competition tool on the EU level basically meant um, a well, a, a much broader power for the Com European Commission to look into violations of competition without necessarily having a violation of Article 101 or 102 and possibilities to remedy the, the situation. Now, the new competition tool in its first assessment when it was shown to the public somehow failed. They, it, it sort of did not get enough support i'm i'm not 100 percent sure why but it but it was taken off the table and what was left was the digital markets act proposal from uh, december 2020 by the european commission which is a powerful regulatory tool which goes a step away from competition to really regulation of companies maybe just to to say what that means because i think that's an important shift that we can that one should keep in mind in competition law we look into behavior of companies basically ex post and try to uh, remedy the behavior. And companies can, can always evoke sort of a very detailed case analysis, looking at the facts and, in, and invoke an efficiency defense saying, yeah, but what we are doing is really efficient. And that's usually done on an individual case by case um, approach, particularly in the field of Article 102. Now, what the Digital Markets Act does is something very different. It gives very precise rules, not just broad standards, but rules for these companies, how they have to behave if they fulfill certain requirements, namely being digital gatekeepers that run a core platform service. And if you do that, you may do this, you may not do that, you may not do that, you may not do that. That's very precise and clear obligations in the Digital Markets Act. Um, and that's something that is a real shift, a regulatory shift from competition, efficiency defense, case-by-case -case assessment to a much more precise rule-based, no efficiency defense um, approach in the Digital Markets Act. Now, that's sort of what's currently happening on the European stage. Now, you asked me for what's going on in Germany and what has going, gone on in Germany. So um, Germany, um, looking particularly at the experiences with the Facebook case that we discussed, but also looking at the European Commission, which struggled so much with the Google cases, taking years to resolve them, 
not finding suitable remedies, Germany stepped forward and said, okay, let's do something about this in competition law. And they introduced, the German legislator introduced in, um, I think, 2021, in January 2021, they introduced a new paragraph into the German Competition Act, which is called 19A, Section 19A. And Section 19A says, if you are a digital gatekeeper, they put that differently. The wording is, if you are a company that is um, has a significant importance for competition across markets, so it's no longer dominance in one market, but competition, uh, you are important for competition in several markets, um, then you are obliged to uh, follow certain uh, requirements, you have certain behavior re restrictions. This is still competition, that's very close to what the DMA does, but it's still competition law because the Bundeskartellamt, the German watchdog, has to activate these provisions. They have to designate the companies and then they have to activate certain of these detailed provisions in um, Section 19A for these specific companies. And the companies can always say, but that is efficient what we do. So it's still a case-by-case -case assessment, but it's much more precise than Article 102 is, or the German Section 19. That's the Section 19A of the German Act, which now sort of stands a bit in parallel or in, comp uh, in competition, maybe even with, with the DMA. And now we have a certain new development, but maybe I don't know whether you want to talk about 19A first or whether you want to go for the latest development in Germany, which is also quite interesting, whatever you like. Uh, let us let us pause for a second with with uh, with, with uh, paragraph nine a of of, of of German competition act. Obviously, the question is when now the the DMA enters into force, what would be the the, the relationship in terms of competence uh, between between these two between between these two, two systems of systems of norms? Well, in my understanding, the um, Article 1 of, of the DMA says competition law, national competition law, is still applicable. And that means, in general, we can apply article, um, or we can apply the articles of the DMA and Section 19A in parallel as a, as a general rule, unless it is really exactly the same, going for exactly the same thing. But then the DMA is no longer about competition, it is about fairness and contestability while competition law is about competition. And that's why it's so important that 19A is not regulatory law, but it's still competition law. And in the B post um, ruling of the European Court of Justice the other day, which dealt with the Nevis and Edem uh, problem, so can you be um, sanctioned twice for the same thing under regulatory law and under competition law? My understanding of that ruling for DMA competition is that if that's a different thing if it goes for into a different direction we have no problem with the overlap um, and and we can apply both of that to that in practice however i think we will see a lot of sort of internal communication going on because i personally do not want to see and cannot imagine that the national competition authority does something which is easily dealt with under the dma or where the european commission has a case running or something like that so I think that many of the problems that are addressed in Section 19A are much more easily dealt with under the DMA. So the DMA will probably claim some practical superiority. And so will the Commission in enforcing, because the European Commission is the sole enforcer in the end of the DMA. And I guess that even though the German Competition Authority is a very uh, self-confident enforcer, uh, the Commission will put a lot of pressure on the German Bundeskartellamt not to go for cases under 19A that are actually part of, of the DMA. But over time, I think that this relationship will change and that we will, we will be very happy um, to have things like 19A and there are similar rules in other countries, I think, um, are coming into existence now. And the point is that the DMA is sort of strict and static in what it says. So it has a lot of precise definitions of what is prohibited and what is not. But over time, the gatekeepers will develop things. I mean, do you expect Google to adhere with the DMA and, and sort of scale down its business, make less profits? No, they will develop new ways of, of going forward. And maybe some of these ways will 
conflict with our ideas of fairness, contestability, and competition. And then we always have competition law in the back end and strong competition provisions like 19A will gain more importance, particularly for features that are not um, core platform services in the definition of the DMA or not run by gatekeepers and for practices that are beyond the DMA but still fall under the more, a bit more general clauses of the 19A. And we already have some some designations. Uh, the first designations uh, in Germany. So the the mechanism, the new mechanism, uh, has started working already. I obviously see some. You know, um, um, you have highlighted some of the mismatches. Uh, so it's not necessarily uh, they will coexist in full harmony. Particularly if you take into account that other jurisdictions either adopt or are considering in, uh, of adopting something of, the, of, of this kind, kind of competition law plus uh, mechanism, which is actually the driving force for the DMA itself. Um, and obviously one can say that the DMA is very clear, the obligations of articles 5-7, uh, but others might also say that it's also quite flexible because it's full of adjectives that allows you know, interpretation, interpretation and specification. And if the commission is really keen to pursue this kind of broader goals, which was the main driving force to introduce this new toolkit at all, then obviously some, some uniformity would be, would be needed because supposedly you cannot, you, you, you don't remedy the market, these systemic problems by simply forcing all the obligations being complied with automatically by all gatekeepers. You play more sophisticated, more somehow Machiavellian perhaps, games with, with, uh, with, with this, and then having uh, parallel jurisdictions, particularly such powerful jurisdictions, who would be driven by the same motivation, but might, might try to play a slightly different game, could be helpful, but could be also um, slightly more you know, difficult to, 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 to square. But I also understand the logic that if there is at some point less uh, active commission, Member states would obviously can can always step in and enforce their domestic their domestic law as well. We also see that the the DMA, uh, the several versions of the DMA, contain quite different elements. They are inspired by the same logic, but the mechanism, procedural mechanisms are slightly different. So, what is your reading, Ruprecht, uh, uh, about the, the the consolidated, the the agreed version of the DMA? Are you satisfied with uh, the, the final wording, or there are elements which you are rather said that they have been abandoned or introduced. Ooh, um, let me let me say one word, maybe maybe on on this on this whole issue that you addressed right now. Um, I'm of course very biased because I'm I'm from Germany. I worked in the Bundeskartellamt for two years back in my youth, but um, so I'm I'm a big fan of German competition law enforcement, and um, I. I sat on a panel once with a guy from the Swedish Competition Authority, and we discussed the question of DMA and how does it relate with national competition laws. And he said, we in Sweden don't want to do anything about these digital giants. That's not our job. We are far too small to take on a company like Google. Uh, so we are happy if the commission does that. And a German competition official would never say that because they feel so powerful and self-confident. But take so, and I sort of adhere to that. But if I take a step back, obviously I would love to see a more coherent European approach to this problem because these companies are one very powerful, and B they are basically active in all European uh, countries. So it would much be much better to to have a strong European enforcement. Let me just sort of add that. On the other hand, I'm also a big fan of experimentalism in the European laboratory of nation state, nations, member states, and the, on the European level, uh, which often shows, and, and the development now in the Facebook case, et cetera, shows that, which often shows that we can maybe try something in Italy and then see it works, it does not work, make a different experience in France, et cetera, and then go forward. So that's sort of just as a, not as a big, uh, as a sort of background to that. Now, regarding the Digital Markets Act, um, it's it's um i really don't know i'm i'm a bit sort of torn in myself myself because on the one hand i admire what the european commission achieved with this act and in particular on the way to the final version now that 
that we see, um, I think that really a lot of good ideas have been put into that. It has been an incredibly speedy performance, a uh, very short time um, and very many good ideas, very precise rules, um, very interesting features in the act, etc. So, so I think there's a lot in that, that where, where I can really say, wow. On the other hand, I'm not sure, I have no clue whether that really works in practice whether that will really have an impact or whether we will see a lot of working around the obligations by the gatekeepers and a lack of enforcement uh, by the commission. And what I mean is um, the, the, that the commission put up 20, I think 21 or so obligations for maybe something like 10, 15, 20 of the biggest companies in the world. And what they strongly rely on in the enforcement system is compliance by these gatekeepers. So the gatekeepers have to submit reports, they have to be compliant, they have to have a compliance officer in their company, et cetera. And I wonder whether this trust in, in the system of compliance really works or whether that ends up ends with compliance officers sending thousands of pages of reports and data to the European Commission, where there are 150 people trying to look into this. And what they actually are able to do is to read it uh, and to uh, put it into a file and that's about it. Uh, so I think the big question is, does enforcement really work? The second flaw that I still see with the DMA, and we've criticized that from the beginning is, I don't really see that it is a very principled approach, something where we see, okay, this is really what we want to achieve in the digital uh, world. So the obligations come from all sorts of pieces and they, they address very different issues. They are not sorted in any meaningful way. So you don't really have an idea what actually is the, what are the guiding principles for the digital world in the future? Or is it just a piecemeal approach where we say, okay, oh, we've seen this may be problematic, that may be problematic, let's all put that in the DMA and then let's see what happens, right? Um, so that's the, the second big criticism that has not been improved over, over time. The third thing is that um, I think that structural separations, divestitures, and the whole issue of mergers um, would need uh, or should have been addressed in a better way. I mean, we now have sort of some kind of obligations in that regard, regarding mergers, they have to sort of, uh, there's an obligation to inform about mergers. And then we have this, in my view, a bit misguided reading of Article 22 of the merger control regulation, um, where the commission takes more powers for itself to, um, to do merger control. I find that a bit shaky uh, and a bit difficult. And but, so I, I think we need to, when we talk about these companies, I think we, particularly the big five, uh, Meta, Amazon, Apple, um, uh, and so on, Alphabet. If we talk about these companies, I wonder whether we still are in a field where we can, where we can deal with um, behavioral ideas and, and where we can really enforce behavioral issues in a meaningful way. So um, I, I wonder whether whether the DMA will really open up the field. I think it doesn't even aim for competition. It aims for a bit com contestability, but in the end, what it does is maybe even sometimes entrench the situation of gatekeepers in the sense, yeah, we accept that they are there, that they have a monopolistic situation and that's it. We've shy away from divestitures and structural separation to a large degree and our merger control is still sort of lacking a lot of bite. Let me, let me add to that one sort of remark from, um, from the German experience, we just had an, um, the Bundeskartell just published a report on the Google advertising or on, on online advertising, the sector inquiry. Um, and that, I think there have been sector inquiries on advertising, I think also in the UK um, and, and other uh, companies. What, what came out of this is that actually in every field, in every uh, piece of the ad tech business, um, Google is there and they dominate thousands of features of ad online advertising. And when they presented this report, I think the Bundeskartellum people said, 
we don't know what to do about this problematic situation if we do not really divest Google. And the Bundeskartam will not do that, I guess, but, but does it now really mean a huge difference if you have more transparency about the data that they use or if they maybe no longer use that one feature together with that other feature or so as the DMA would propose, or would we need a more clear-cut situation? Right, you raised a few, few really, really interesting points in, in, in this answer. Maybe the latest one, um, the, the sector inquiry on uh, online platforms and digital advertising in Germany, um, and the response that the divest divestiture would be the, probably the only meaningful remedy. Um, I, I recollect a recent um, interview with Megan Ryan, the former vice president of uh, DuckDuckGo, and she said mm, 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 that she, if you just split them, if you just separate them, it it you wouldn't prevent you would necessarily prevent them from from sharing information in pretty much the same way or facilitating each other somehow communicate. Obviously, we have an, an experience with, with uh, structural separation um, in other areas of law. Do you think it, can, it could work or it's, the, the area is so technical that uh, it would be really difficult to police unless we come back to, to behavioral issues? I mean, that probably depends very much on how you do that divestiture. Um, if you, I, I mean, the divestiture is like, you can do it vertically, uh, so separate certain levels. You can do it horizontally. Um, you can um, try to really isolate one bit out of it or something. You can maybe even share data in a much interoperability and data sharing may also be some kind of structural separation uh, or, or so. I think it really depends. And, and obviously no one can really say what happens, but in the at and um, uh, separation um, in the United States, what we saw that after they had been separated, they really developed into, into separate companies. Now they, after years, they <laughs> merged again. But, but from, from day one on, that's what economic research on that shows, they, it, it made a difference who owns them. So maybe that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's true as well. But there's one very interesting point in your, in, your, in your question, I think, and that is, also something that I was missing a bit in the digital regulation sphere now is that we are not really very strong in looking at the tech aspects of this. So um, as you say, technology is, is so important and maybe so intertwined, and we still haven't made the step as lawyers from our traditional legal codifications to Lawrence Lessig's idea of code is law. Uh, so maybe we would have been, maybe would have fared better if we had had more uh, IT people, more more uh, computer nerds and ha hackers, whatever, in the process of legislation, because they could have possibly said different things than us that we write down words and believe that this is put into practice. And do you think there is a room for uh, horizontal new entries into, into, into co core platform services? Is there any service uh, which is more open than other in your view? Or should, is it within the legitimate mission or for task of not necessarily competition authorities, but the commission who, is, who, who wears various hats simultaneously? Um, should they also consider this factor? And because it's a very delicate and risky area on one hand, it's kind of social engineering or economic engineering um, and Pandora box or Trojan horse, who knows? Uh, <laughs> but it, it's, it's very tempting to, to, to look at this issue from this perspective. Hard to tell. I mean, it's quite interesting that we sometimes see things like, um, say, TikTok as a, as a service that seems to eat into the business of Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook, um, where consumer preferences somehow seem to move very fast and, and sort of something happens. Um, on the other hand, I think that I wouldn't, go for, I wouldn't go for real competition in the sense of having a substitute for that, but I would go for disruption. So we need to make sure that it is possible to have the next step not taken by one of the big gatekeepers and being integrated into their ecosystem, but something new coming up that they don't stop. 
And that is why I'm so eager to look into merger control and the questions of killer acquisitions and kill zones, et cetera. Um, because if, if we see disruption uh, and if we see disruption coming, they are probably seeing that as the first people on earth, they will try to buy that off or they will try to drive that out of the market before. And, and there we need to make a real stop sort of that so that other owners, other companies can flourish in that regard. So my, but, but whether the commission can support that, yeah, my, I mean, how do you support a new startup coming up with a disruptive technology? You invest into education, you invest into research, you, you give them a very good technical infrastructure, you give them private equity resources, et cetera. That's probably much more important than, than regulating um, the behavior of existing gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're running out of time. I'm very tempted to ask a few more questions on the DMA. Probably I'll, I'll limit myself to one. And then obviously I'll ask you to, to, to highlight to us uh, very briefly the latest development in German competition law. We, we, we have some um, interesting story there. Limiting the, uh, the one question on the DMA, you write on this, uh, you, you have written on this recently and probably more than once uh, on private enforcement. Um, Based on your logic, if I read it correctly, I, the, the DMA can be, the, the, it would be good to have the DMA obligations being complied with, that if gatekeepers comply with all the catalog of obligations, we could improve incrementally maybe only, but at least it's, it's the movement in the right direction. So your view is that the, the, the more obligations, the more vigilantly we enforce the obligations and uh, uh, monitor the, the, the compliance with obligations, the better the outcomes. And thus, who better can uh, facilitate this than private companies with, with, with their interests? So I understand that you are pro private enforcement. The DMA has rather different, obviously, it opened the door from the backside with, with collective actions uh, in Article 42. What is your view on, on, on this aspect? Yeah, um, as you say, private enforcement, on the one hand, is a fallback option if the commission fails to enforce. That's the first thing that we need to um, notice. So if commission resources do not, uh, are, are not are sort of too restrained or if political priorities change and the DMA is not enforced on the commission level, we always have private enforcement. The second thing is private market actors are the ones who suffer most and who know best what's happening. You, if you look into commission cases, you don't see a lot of commission cases or um, competition cases where it's not private complainants, not private parties driving the investigation and, and giving the information. Now, if you cannot rely on the instances doing that, you have to take the case to court yourself. And that's sort of something that I think is very important. I think we see that also in competition damages claims, how fruitful or how interesting, how vitalizing that can be for, for competition enforcement in general. Of course, we run into a problem of coherence, of um, having a sort of system that is uh, uh, still somewhat systematic. If we have a case running in, um, uh, one running in Paris, one running in Dusseldorf, and another one ru running in Sofia. And, and if, we, if we have that, yeah, well, then we have the European Court of Justice trying to align that, trying to give a good reading of the DMA. Um, but I see that as a chance. That's, uh, that's again, the European laboratory um, uh, of, of um, uh, the EU where we, where we reach our aim of having a unified uh, European digital law in a better way than if only the Commission has the power to enforce. I mean, that's also a question of democracy somehow, that people can take their rights into their hands and do not rely on just one central huge authority. So I'm very positive towards uh, private enforcement. I think it's a big chance. Obviously, it's difficult for private claimants to sue the gatekeepers because they are so powerful, they can take you up to the highest courts. But still, I think that's a way we need to go for. And also, as you say, with collective um, actions, yes. Uh, but then obviously the counter argument would be that, A, it's time consuming, i.e. that would be one of the counter arguments why, we, why we, we have decided to go into much speedier process, more kind of logistical argument uh, or expedience. Uh, and another one is more kind of theoretical. The obligations, the, 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 all, the essence of the DMA is rather interventionist. So it's kind of, we introduced this tool and uh, the, the fruits are hanging so low 
for public enforcement, if we do it, for, if we open the door for private enforcement, particularly with this kind of capital uh, engagement, strategic litigation, is the tool as such, is this catalog of obligations designed for be, to be enforced privately, uh, even in, if you're talking about follow-on uh, follow action, or it's rather designed to be so easy to apply for public enforcement to remedy the problems with kind of with, uh, speed and uh, casuistic and econometrics, uh, which the commission encountered uh, in enforcing ex post competition policy. Well, if it's easy to do and if the commission uh, does it well, there will be no need for private enforcement and the cases will be dismissed and no one will go to court and everyone will be happy <laughs> with the commission. But if, it, if the commission does not do the deal, uh, then, we, uh, then we go the other way. That's, that would be sort of my idea. And the commission knows that if it, tr if it gives certain s substantial rights to to users, for instance, then these users have the right to enforce that. That's, I mean, that's standing jurisprudence of the Court of Justice for years, that if you have a right from European law, then yeah, go to court and, and enforce it. So they were, they had that in mind. So if they hadn't wanted that, they would have to exclude that somehow that, that private enforcement is possible. By the way, and this leads to, the, to your potential next question, in the amendment now planned for the German uh, Competition Act, what the German government has done in proposing, uh, it's not yet in, in law, but what they do is A, they give the Bundeskartellamt the necessary powers to help the commission, to assist the commission um, in enforcement, but they also introduce rules to make the DMA private enforcement more speedy and more effective in Germany. So essentially applying the rules that we know from the damages directive on to the DMA, which is a really stunning or interesting move. And, and they say, uh, they also say we have specialized courts you take these to specialized courts not to just any court and you can use all the tools that we know from uh, competition damages litigation in these dma cases as well that's one one of the tiny aspects of the new amendment and what is what is else in the new amendment can you just go yeah the, yeah sure um there is one other thing which is very let me just mention it very briefly which is that the Bundeskartellamt becomes more powerful in in that they can better skim off illegal profits uh, that have been very difficult under German law so far. Uh, but that's a very sp specific German aspect, I would say. But the interesting thing is that uh, Germany now um, uh, copies and pastes, if I may say so, the UK system of uh, sector inquiries. Um, and uh, we have sector inquiries, of course. But what is now added is that after a sector inquiry, even without finding a real violation of the law, the Bundeskartellamt may take action um, to remedy market failures that it perceived. And um, I think you are much better into that than I am, that this is something that the CMA is able to do and did in the past with, with uh, some of the very uh, fundamental investigations that you had. For Germany, it's something completely new. Uh, one of my, my staff members said, this is a really paradigm shift that we now replace legal violations with economic violations as the ground for action. Um, it also speaks of divestitures that may be possible under this. So essentially it's the new competition tool that we discussed earlier in this talk uh, now on the national level, which may make the Bundeskartelle much more powerful. Amazing. Uh, Ruprecht, it, it, it is always a pleasure talking to you and learning from you. It, it's a never ending never ending process for, for many of us. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. My last question um, uh, is probably more pragmatic for those uh, who are at the beginning of, of their academic or practical career. Uh, you have uh, an exp experience in, in, in Bundeskartelland in the past. You are a, a well-known, renowned professor of competition on pri and private law. Uh, in 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 Heine uh, University in Dusseldorf, you run a uh, stunning block and competition policy. You have this cluster of of young scholars as well, who you constantly supervise and advise and uh, you know shape. Uh, so you have this kind of you are in constant contact with policymakers, legislators. What would be your suggestion for the beginners? Where should they? Where maybe how they have to? 
focus their attention in, in this really promising, very rapidly developing area? What would be, be one or two topics which you would recommend probably for them to focus and how maybe, maybe some mistakes which have, they have to avoid, etc. Oh, wow. Uh, first of all, Olesh, let me thank you for, for this talk. And I can only give back to you what you said. You are an inspiration to very many people in the competition community, particularly with your very, very thoughtful approach. Let me just say that to all the listeners and hearers of the, this uh, talk, what, what, a, what a treasure you are for, for, for us uh, that we enjoy so much. So thank you for, for having me. Now, my advice to young people, I think what is important... <laughs> find your own path, that's the most important thing. But what I found very fruitful, um, and, and I think what, what still drives me today is um, go back to the roots, try to read the, the huge authoritative texts, um, or maybe non-authoritative texts, uh, read your Hayek, uh, in, go, to, go to Adam Smith, uh, read what people from the Chicago School uh, wrote. Um, if you're German, go for the auto liberal uh, readings, etc. Try to really think of competition of the economy as something very fundamental and ask yourself the question, what is this all about? Because we often discuss the technicalities, the details, maybe not, I mean, not the two of us, maybe you are very philosophical and very of your, you, you often engage with philosophy, but um, and uh, much more so than I do, but but um, usually as a young person, be it in academia or in practice, you are often confronted with, with very technical details. Is the merger regulation this or that, or do we have to, et cetera. And, but always take a step back, uh, maybe on the weekend and say, okay, why am I doing this? What is this all about? Uh, how do markets function? What can we as lawyers, what can we as economists do to make the markets function better? Um, and that is also driving me in, in, in doing this because it's so fundamental, it really, and, and particularly in these times with Lina Khan in, in the United States, um, and, and which, which is an inspiring figure, but so, so a person that I also have a lot of, well, difficult points with, et cetera. But what these questions are up now, we are, we are in a digital transformation, maybe even in, an, in, an, in a revolution of our whole business economy world. So think, Take a step back. What do we want to achieve, and what can you, be your contribution to that? I think that's important for everyone, and then then this becomes fun. and And that's that's actually uh, my last word. I think the field of law that we are engaging is is enormous fun because you always deal with the products that you come across every day. You see how people act, how they interact, how they decide, what decisions they take. I mean, look, we are we are dealing with Facebook, Amazon, Apple, the most exciting companies on, on earth. And on the other hand, we are also dealing with the coffee shop next door if, if they go into a price uh, cooperation with that other coffee shop on the, over the street, right? So, um, so it's there every, everywhere and that's what makes the fun of it. And if you don't lose the fun, you will keep going in this field um, on and on and you'll, you'll probably also find a lot of uh, interesting paths sideways and, and even on the main road. Absolutely, I, I I fully concur with this. Really, really brilliant advice about this kind of driving force. Be, be constantly interested in what you're doing. That's the, probably the main motivation and the main um, navigator to to your academic and professional life. Rupert Paulson, thank you very much indeed for for this. Thanks really, to you. Really informative and uh, thought provoking. Uh, conversation and uh, for, for, for highlighting to us so many important so important issues uh, it was a pleasure talking to you I hope uh, we will have a chance to discuss the, the latest development maybe in, uh, at some time in the future as well thank you so much Olesh. thank you